Hello, and welcome to the Mr. 50mm YouTube channel. I'm Mr. 58mm. I got a little bit bigger. Today, we're going to be looking at another lens that was voted on in the community tab, no less. I know, the poll was quite some time ago, but hopefully that's all right. Now, if you haven't figured it out from the community tab or from the video title, the brand that won out was the Minolta slash Sony lens. So with that, I had a look at the lens collection that I have and realized that I really never used my Minolta 58mm f1.4 MC Rockor PC. And this lens is apparently a soap bubble goddess. So let's go make some bubbles and let's get into it. So what is the Minolta 58mm f1.4 MC Rocker PF? This is it. And it is no spring chicken. It is more like a winter chicken maybe, or an ice age chicken. I'm not sure. This lens is a lens by Minolta, if that wasn't clear. And it was released in 1966. It is the MC variant of the SR bayonet mount. Uh, and it has many iterations, with the most common one that you probably might have heard of being the MD mount, all of which are compatible with each other. Now, being an older lens, the build is very nice. Nice chunky metal construction here, and the lens has a maximum aperture of 1.4. And it stops down to f16 in half-stop clicky increments, controlled by this silver ring here. Now, this lens features a six non-rounded aperture blade set and focus throw is, as at least near as I can tell, about 180 degrees. The lens uses 55 millimeter filters and closest focusing distance is 60 centimeters. It weighs about 275 grams, not with, a, not with the adapters and whatnot. And I couldn't find the original MSRP for this thing. Uh, but I did find a very cool website that scanned a bunch of product bro brochures for camera systems, and I'll post a link to that in the description below for anyone that wants to have a look. Anyways, I enjoyed perusing that site while scripting this video quite a bit. Currently, the going rate for one of these is somewhere between 55 and 110 USD. Shooting with the Minolta. 58 millimeter. Now, for this review, we'll be shooting this lens primarily on my Sony a7 III with the adapter to let it be mounted on the E-mount system that is the Sony a7 III. And uh, that's unfortunately it. Well, at this time, I do have a Minolta film SLR, the X700. I haven't shot this lens on it yet. And at this time, I don't have a GFX adapter, so we're not going to get the perspective of a bigger sensor. But if I do get one, I may make a follow-up video for just that a little bit later. Now, my copy, as you can see here, has seen some rough days. But even still, this focus ring is still buttery smooth and, again, 180 degrees. It's pretty good, fairly long, not super quick, but pretty precise. The lens finishing with these little grooves means that it's pretty lovely to use, if not a bit chilly on cold days. And again, that half stop aperture ring has nice distinct clicks and has a good grab. Now at 100, uh, 275 grams, it is a bit heavy, especially with the adapter on the a7 III, but I do think that's mainly due to the fact that the adapter increases the length. Uh, and, you know, compared to a modern 51.4, this probably feels like a featherweight anyways. But this does feel quite a bit denser due to its metal build. Overall, the lens has a pretty good feel in hand, as well as, you know, a lot of other older lenses from this vintage. Shooting with the Minolta 58mm, the image quality. First off, this is a pretty vintage lens, and as a result, you can expect that at wide open apertures, you get, you get a bit of dreamy haze. But again, if you're looking at a classic 50, you're probably aware that most of them are just kind of like that, wide open. 
swap down to F2 and onward, and you mostly eliminate the dreaminess. So, you know, just keep that in mind if you're shooting this thing. That is so far so standard for this type of vintage 50. But what about vignetting? Well, wide open, it's pretty severe, but it's correctable in post. Or you could alternatively lean into it and use it as part of a way to, you know, frame up your subjects in the center. Now, the performance does get better when you stop down, and by f4 to 5.6, I find it pretty negligible. So again, things to keep in mind when shooting this classic 50. Sharpness, wide open, it's not bad in the center. Again, you get that dreaminess and it does make it seem softer than it actually is. Stopping down does dramatically improve it. And by about 2.8, the center is very good. The corners though, they're a bit of a different story. They aren't sharp, wide open, and there's quite a bit of smearing. Now, they also do improve when you stop down, but you really gotta get to like F8, F11 before the corners get all right. Uh, and, you know, they're not great. Unfortunately, after that, you're probably gonna get diffraction coming in as a bigger factor when it comes to sharpness. Now. This is going to be a pretty stark comparison to the 50mm Sony E-mount lens and overall, aside from the extreme corners being pretty sharp, even wide open, and you know, the Sony does better when it comes to sharpness, uh, even when you stop it down at equivalent f-stops. And again, in the corners, the Sony at like f4 looks pretty awesome. color, I'm going to compare the, uh, again, the Sony E-mount with uh, this 58mm. And again, it's a pretty mediocre lens, but the first thing I did notice was that Minolta, the Minolta's colors were pretty warm. Now, the settings aren't exactly the same, but for the exposure and the lighting conditions, they're pretty close. And I did try to take those into account when I set the white balance and color tints of both uh, image sets that come out of the A7. I do like the color rendition on the Minolta to the rendition on the Sony. But that's probably not what we're here for. We're here for bubbles and bokeh. That's the main reason why we're here, right? Well, that's good because you do create some pretty good bubbles when you use this lens. And it does make them in a pretty pronounced way. And, you know, if you're not aware, uh, the bubble effect is when the bokeh balls don't have a smooth transition, but have a bright edge around the perimeter. And this is typically seen as a flaw to be corrected in modern lenses, but, you know, 
Aside from modern lenses, there are lenses that do, do, that do this on purpose, like the TT Artisan 100mm f2.8 or the new old Meyer Optic Gurlitz Trio Plan 100mm f2.8. Now, I do want to state the Minolta doesn't make them as pronounced as the 100mm lenses, as, you know, 100 millimeters gives you an advantage in scene compression after all. However, I do really like the way that this lens does do it. With the corner smearing and the cat's eye on the edges, the bokeh also tends to swirl a bit, and the bubbles that swirl look pretty good, and I'm a fan of it. And I guess it can look busy in many scenarios, but you know, you're probably after that anyways if you want this lens. Now, if you do want it to bokeh like the bubbles, I suggest shooting this lens uh, between four to seven feet for your subject with your background uh, being hopefully fairly contrasty. Foliage is a great background to set up to induce the bokeh uh, as the bubbles will kind of come up as a result of all the dramatic lighting changes. But, you know, when you're not trying to intentionally do the bubble bokeh, this lens is also capable of delivering fairly smooth bokeh. recommendation and conclusion. So we'll go back to the price. As I said, it's somewhere between 60 and 100 USD with the online auction sites that is the E of Bays. And they also are pretty plentiful. So you shouldn't have a problem finding one of these if you do want them. Now, again, this is a little bit expensive for a vintage lens, but it's really pretty cheap when you compare it to a modern 50. It's also cheaper than the current in-production bubbly lenses. Mind you, it's not as bubbly, but I personally find 58 millimeters a good focal length, and I find it personally more useful than 100 millimeters. And on price alone, I think it's a pretty good lens buy if you just wanna try some bubbly goodness and have a still technically pretty good lens when it's stopped down. Now, for maximum effect, I would recommend this for full frame users. And apparently this will also cover the GFX's larger sensor format. So it could be pretty good on there too, but I don't know, without an adapter right now, I personally can't tell you how it is, but additionally, it is a lens that, you know, it adapts pretty well to mirrorless cameras and the mirrorless camera advantage of letting you punch in to focus, I think is pretty great. And I also don't actually think it's possible to adapt it to any DSLR mounts as the flange distance for the Minolta mount was pretty short. And I think that, uh, I think the only systems that really will let you work with achieving infinity focus that are DSLRs are the Olympus Four Thirds cameras, not the Micro Four Thirds, although you can put it on that, and apparently Leica M. But, you know, 
back to the point about adapting it for mirrorlesses or mirrorless cameras. The adapter is a simple one and has no electronics on it and it tends to be very cheap. I got mine for around 25 USD. And I will say though, adapting it to mirrorless does make the handling a little less good when compared to like a film SLR as the weight does get a bit front heavy since the build is pretty metal and it's pretty dense. But you know, I didn't notice it that much until I actually just put on my Sony 51.8, which is physically larger, but a lot less dense. So the weight of weight balance just felt better with the Sony, but you know, really that's, that's about it. And you know, based on how long my uh, videos are, I think that's probably a good place to wrap it up. But question for you, do you have one of these lenses or do you like bubbly lenses? or not care for it at all, or do you even hate it? Uh, either way, let me know in the comments below, and don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe. Maybe a super thanks if you're into that. Till next time, bye.